Welcome everyone, Costin here with a new discussion video for Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. In this particular video, I want to talk about DLC and which factions, races if you will. Personally, I do differentiate between a legendary lord and a faction. Like for me, the faction is the race, the legendary lord is the legendary lord. Uh, but in this video, we're talking about races basically. Which factions, races are best played if you don't own any DLC because this stuff is expensive if you were to buy every DLC pack for Warhammer free it would cost you probably hundreds of dollars including the base games now to play Immortal Empires you do need to own the free games Warhammer 1, 2 and 3 but which are the best factions to play without owning any DLC there are plenty of them and I've disabled for this video all of the ones that are paid i'm not counting the ones that are free in any way shape or form i'm just talking here about stuff that is paid so we have entire races like the vampire coast the tomb kings the beastmen the wood elves they're taken out norska as well and the ogre kingdoms now sure i imagine quite a few people would have norska or um or the ogre kingdoms or even the warriors of chaos like archeon kolik and sigvald uh, they would have them because they pre-ordered their first, second, or third game, or all of them. Like, that's exactly what I've done. I've gotten uh, access to those because I did pre-order Warhammer 2, 1, 2, and 3. But uh, I do want to talk about what is what are the best choices for you if you don't want to spend dozens and dozens of dollars or hundreds of dollars on DLC. What are best choices with no DLC whatsoever except the free stuff? Interestingly enough, for Immortal Empires, they've given Bellacor of the Warriors of Chaos for free. And that is where I will start with Bellacor, who actually has a good way of earning the Sword of Cain pretty quickly, though over here I have sacked uh, the settlement, whereas really I should have just taken out this faction, taken out their settlements and reduced them to the Shrine of Cain, waited for them to claim the sword, and then I could have claimed them with Bellacor. Either way, regardless of my own mistakes in a certain campaign, the Warriors of Chaos are an incredible race. I do not have any DLC installed here except free stuff. That's all. And being able to play the Warriors of Chaos for free, well, I guess it's not for free. You need to own the first sec and second game to be able to play Mortal Empires. But basically, being able to play the Warriors of Chaos without owning the Warriors of Chaos DLC pack or the Champions of Chaos DLC pack is probably your best choice because in terms of raw power because the warriors of chaos are an incredibly powerful faction why is that well they have really good army recruitment so you got re uh, regional or provincial recruitment that gives you a certain number of options here i could get some trolls i could get some marauders i could get some warhounds and i've literally just arrived here i teleport to bellacor over here um, Bellacor starts here. He gets certain advantages. He gets a major upkeep benefit with demonic units, which are pretty good. Um, he starts with all of the Gifts of Chaos, so you get access to a lot here. He's actually one of the strongest legendary lords in the game, I think. Like, Archeon is overall stronger just because of his vassal benefit, but being able to start with all of these Gifts, even if you won't use them necessarily from the very start, means that you can get post battle loot pretty quickly, replenishment uh, on a global and foreign territory very quickly various other benefits. Now, I don't necessarily think Tsinch or Solanesh are worth it, but you can check my uh, guide on the Gifts of Chaos to understand that. But yeah, Bellacor starts in a really good position, and he can also spawn Rifts. That's exactly what I've done. I moved the Lord here in this province, I spawned the Rift, and then I moved through uh, uh, through a Rift um, over here that I, uh, I set up. You can do so with Unholy Manifestations, you can set up a Rift uh, pretty quickly and I teleported him over here to get the Sword of Cain. Just being able to get the Sword of Cain so early on is an incredible benefit in its own right. And you have a faction that has really good recruitment. So if I were to recruit a Lord over here, I could get a lot of units here very quickly in a very short time. So that recruitment benefit means you, uh, you can get a lot of things done very, very quickly. The economy is also strong because the tier one building here generates, uh, the tier one income building generates 400. That's the one of the largest in the game outside of special structures. Like you would need uh, any 
comparison would be like a Kislev city, but you can do it in any Dark Fortress. Now, of course, you can only do this in Dark Fortresses, and there's a certain limit to them. But you have one here. You can also get three more, four more. Uh, very quickly as Bellacor, like as I have done here. So that's five that I get and six if I want to do that. And each of those, just from the tier one building, will generate 400. But also the settlement building generates far more than the vast majority of other settlement buildings. Now, sure, a province of four regions like Reichland could generate you more income if you were to build it up. But the main settlement is 200, goes to 400 at level two compared to, say, 120 at level 2 for the Norskans, you can gain a lot of money. So 200, from, uh, 200 by default from for the main settlement building of a Dark Fortress, 400 at level 2. Uh, and at level 2, you get two other benefits as well. You can get a cash shrine, which gives you an income benefit of 30% for your region and 20% uh, income from all buildings. Not just yourself, uh, but your vassals as well. So I'm j so I'm increasing my vassal income. Though the vassal income is not going going to be the best in the world, but I'm generating forty five hundred from settlement building, six hundred from vassals, and the background income is three hundred as well as a bit from trade. You won't have the best trade income, though you will have some trade. So warriors of chaos can set up a very, very strong economy early on. And the major benefit that they have from an economic standpoint or a campaign standpoint is these Dark Fortresses are heavily fortified settlements. Even if you don't recruit an army to defend them, the AI is generally not going to attack them. Very rarely in all the campaigns I fought since Immortal Empires came out, even with the Warriors of Chaos in in the Realms of Chaos, like with the Champions of Chaos in, in the Realm of Chaos campaign, even there, very rarely has Dark Fortress been attacked to begin with. And having one under a genuine threat, I don't think that's happened in any of the campaigns. I play on Legendary. Uh, and so you, these are incredibly strong uh, places they have good garrisons and as the warriors of chaos you can recruit units very very quickly i think of all the factions that are available for free right now or rather just only warhammer 1 2 and free to access immortal empires i do think the warriors of chaos are certainly by far and away the best faction they are one they are the strongest faction currently in the game and Creative Assembly has even buffed them recently by allowing them to vassalize human and elven factions, so they have a lot going for them. It is the flexibility of recruitment. There are limits uh, with Warband recruitment. There are going to be limits, but you will have a strong, varied armies. Trolls, spawn, marauders themselves are pretty good. Now, what limitations are you going to have by not owning any of the DLC? Well, a couple. So the DLC, the Champions of Chaos DLC specifically, would allow you to specialize one of your lords or heroes, or all of them, to one god or another. Does that matter? Not necessarily so much. Undivided is generally one of the strongest paths. Some specializations, like Chosen of Nurgle, uh, with great weapons, because great weapon uh, Chosen are really, really good. Uh, having Marauders for specific gods, so for instance here, with no DLC, I don't get access to the Marauders of Khorne, Nurgle, Selenesh, but I can get access to the Chaos Warriors. What, but there are limitations, I don't get access to uh, Chosen of Nurgle, so I can get Chaos Warriors of Nurgle, but I can't get Chosen of Nurgle, though there are still plenty of things that I do have access to, like Exalted, Exalted Units. For instance, with Bellacor, one of the things he can do is get Exalted uh, de demonic units. Most Chaos Warriors only get like normal units. Uh, difficult to get exalted ones, far more difficult. But he can take the he can take um, regular demonic units like demonets, blood uh, blood letters, plague fires, and he can upgrade them with the technology. He can upgrade them to being exalted. Now I would need the research for it to be able to do it. But that is an incredible amount of power. And sure, you won't have cho Chosen and Nurgle, but you do have Chosen, Undivided Chosen, with great weapons, which are some of the best units in the game. And crucially for your cavalry, you do still have access to things like Skull Crushers of Corn, which are your best cavalry unit, as well as um, 
as well as the Doom Knights of Cinch, which are also pretty good units. Now you don't get, you have limitations with your Marauders or with your Chosen line, you do have limitations, but you do have a lot of flexibility with your Demons and with your Cavalry. And more than that, really, more than that, if I go back here to my initial province, you still get a lot of gifted units. I actually think you get pretty much all of the gifted units, so you can get things like Hell Cannons, Skull Cannons, uh, Soul Grinders, like, basically, you get access to all the demonic units, because the demonic units were with, uh, were launched with Warhammer 3. And so you have access to pretty much all of that, more or less. Dragon Ogres, Bloodthirsters, Great Unclean Ones. A whole roster of units that is incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful in a lot of ways. And if I just take the Shrine of Cain here for this video, uh, if I if I look at this... He doesn't have, for his army, as a lord, he, uh, I'm not sure where it's said, I'm not sure where the effect comes in, but he doesn't have these limitations of gifted units. So Bellacor is incredibly potent. Just being able to stack gifted units, like if I go to the gifts and if I, let's say, choose something over here, uh, don't necessarily have that. Well, I can get some Chaos Furies, okay. And I recruit right? There is no limit. So you can make an entire demonic army, you can stack dragon ogres, you can stack blood firsters. Like, you want to make a blood firster doom stack as Bellacor? You can do that. That is incredibly powerful in general, DLC or not. So you can't do wrong playing as Bellacor. Warriors of Chaos are currently one of the best designed races, the most powerful race, and Bellacor, even with owning no DLC whatsoever, is in a really, really good spot. You have a lot of power, sure. You won't have uh, the dedication to Nurgle, but here's the thing, even with that. Although I don't have uh, the ability to devote my heroes and lords to Nurgle or to Slanish and all that, I still have access to all of their gifts, right? I still have access to the gift tree, I still have access to the entire tech tree. You just have some limitations with units, but what you get even with no DLC, is still incredibly potent, and you it will allow you to dominate the map with ease. This is on Legendary. You can dominate the map with ease as Bellicor, and he's actually a really fun lord as well because of the portals. Like, you can spawn them around the world, and you can get pretty far around the world because of, of that, uh, that situation. You, you have a great deal of power, flexibility, you name it. Now, the second faction to talk about here, the second race, if you will, to talk about here are the Greenskins. The Greenskins are one of the most powerful races in the entire game, but they're really powerful even with no DLC, though obviously missing regiments of Naran, Rogue Idols, and so on is going to affect you. But here's the thing, even with no DLC, you still have access to Grimgor, Azag, and Warzak, who is a free DLC faction, you can get them for free. Um, and he has a significant benefit to Savage Orcs, and he's a really, really powerful caster himself with significant benefits to his faction. Warzag in general wipes the floor with the dwarves in pretty much in any campaign. If you're playing a dwarven campaign as Forgrim, you are going to have a nightmare dealing with him. He is more powerful if you do own the Grom, and, Grom the Punch DLC because you would be able to get the Regiment of Renown Rogue Idol very quickly in his campaign. But regardless of that, Greenskins are in a really, really good spot. But why is that? Well, they can confederate other Greenskins, as I've done here. This is a rebel faction, if you will, that I started at war with. Uh, and you can confederate with them pretty much on turn one by killing their boss. Not necessarily recommended because you do uh, you will suffer the confederation penalty, not too fond of that, uh, in terms of pub uh, public order. But here's what makes the Greenskins strong. First off, they have a lot of recruitment slots, so you can get an army very, very quickly with uh, relative ease. So you can recruit a lot of units. You also have, you have more limited global recruitment slots, so you can increase that. You have a good economy as well. You can trade, but you do have the pile of shiny stuff. This is not necessarily on the level of Dark Fortress, but it's only got free tiers, so you can get the most out of it, and you can increase it to level 500 at level 3. And on top of that, the Greenskins, although they can trade, they gain an enormous benefit from post-battle loot, the amount of money you get after fighting a battle, as well as benefit to income with the structure, especially with the raiding stashes, benefit to income from, uh, from sacking and looting settlements. And... 
generally looting and sacking settlements as many factions obviously carries within some negatives like if you sack a settlement then you need to repel it, repair it well you're gonna gain so much money from looting and sacking that you'll certainly have enough money to repair so here this is only 600 um 600 to get that buck back up but on top of that the green skins at level one of any settlement get either 250 income or 20 growth the growth for the green skins is incredibly potent they gain a lot of growth very quickly especially on some of their lords so they have a lot going for them uh, so you can get a lot of growth or a lot of income and then at tier three for minor settlements you can gain significant benefits for campaign movement range in a region ambush uh post battle loot income from sacking and looting settlements you also have incredible control as the greenskins with uh, the boss's tent going all the way to a level three as boss's shack if you have a level four you can get the boss camp which gives you even more control greenskins are incredibly strong not as strong as warriors of chaos who have uh, who rely on vassals and dark fortresses but they are incredibly strong in the sense that you can get a lot of income control and growth from a province very quickly and very very effectively and you can raise very large armies and that's not be that's before you count the wa mechanic like you fill this meter up you'll gain control you'll gain more growth more control recruitment costs and then when you declare a wa every single army that you do have will gain a major buff in either me uh, weapon strength or ranged weapon strength uh, and we'll also get basically we'll also double in size like for instance if i were to declare a wa this army that's going to get 15 units we get another 15 units through the wa mechanic though you can't necessarily replace those units of the wa army that's tied to your own army very very easily but yeah significant uh, benefits to the greenskins ever since their rework with the grom the punch patch the greenskins have been one of the strongest races in the entire game from warhammer 2 that hasn't changed in immortal empires now with the greenskins by default you're going to be strong what do you lose if you don't have any of the dlc there's only two packs two paid packs there's the skarsenik dlc and there's grom of course you lose those legendary lords skarsenik not necessarily the best grom incredibly powerful but you certainly can get a lot of things done with grimgore azak and and warzak but what are you going to lose? Well, you are going to lose some goblin infantry, the nasty skulkers. You're going to lose squigs. You're not going to have squigs. So some structures may not necessarily seem uh, the best. But outside of that, really, you're still going to gain an enormous amount. You still have night goblin archers available to you and night goblin fanatics for really good archer units. For a free DLC, you get, still get can get the black orc big boss. You're going to lose... Um, pump wagons so you're losing some chariots though you still have some choices when it comes to that uh because you, you can still get the orc boar chariots it's not uh pump uh goblins um goblin chariots are much easily accessible like you could you could just get the goblin toolbox and get that earlier so you do lose some units it affects more structures some structures more than others you also lose uh the river uh, you lose trolls you lose stone trolls you lose river trolls you lose the river troll hag which is a powerful caster more importantly has army replenishment you already are in a good position when it comes to that but you um when it comes to replenishment that but i would buff it through the stratosphere allowing you to just go from battle to battle to battle even while losing a lot of men and being able to recover from that so certainly you do lose things but at the end of the day the greenskins are in a really really good spot by default and even though the loss of replenishment i'd say is probably the biggest uh, thing the the biggest thing you're going to be concerned about yeah trolls can be nice but they're not necessarily the best units and you still have savage orcs especially if playing with warzag you still have most of your roster you have your artillery the greenskins are just a race that is incredibly strong incredibly good can expand across the map relentlessly can get the powerful economy powerful public order have good research uh to get going you still have access to the scrap upgrade uh, on units that's not tied to the grom the punch dlc where with that dlc the scrap mechanic was introduced uh to faction you still have scrap you still have individual unit upgrades you still have the reworked uh, tech tree the free stuff they added with Ground the Punch made this one of the best races in the game. 
and that remains the case even while having no DLC whatsoever in Warhammer uh, free. Now, number three on this list, we have a faction that doesn't have any DLC. Well, some free stuff, some regiments of renown that you can get, though these are available for uh, for free. But outside of that, Grand Cafe is a full-on functional faction, even though they don't have any DLC, because they were a baseline faction for Warhammer Free. Although it has to be said, now all of the baseline factions of Warhammer Free, the Demons of Chaos in particular, work very well at the moment. So just because they're, they were a baseline faction for the third game in a long series, does not mean that uh, they will work very well. But Grand Cafe certainly does. Why is that? Well. Cafe is in a relatively safe spot. Yes, you do have some legendary lords, dark elves, Skaven uh, to worry about, uh, warriors of chaos to the north, some threats to deal with, but you certainly have the economy, the public order, the armies to deal with. It's not the insane insanity of the greenskins who can just continuously expand across the map, but their position is so safe that they can get a lot of things done very, very quickly with a with uh, with a great deal of power so if i look at grand cafe in the building browser you can see that you have your infantry which uh, like by default you can recruit peasant long spears and archers they're gonna do a decent enough job especially the archers but then with your main military building you can get uh, jade warrior crossbowmen halberds and jade warriors good melee uh, good melee anti-infantry anti-large units as well as good Archer units with Jade Warriors and especially Jade Warrior Crossbowmen, which are armored and shielded. You also get uh, high tier infantry with Celestial Dragon Guard and Celestial Dragon Guard Crossbowmen. If there is anything to be said about Cafe, is that their current roster feels a bit stale, but it does absolutely work. You are limited in heroes, sadly enough, so I think that's where the DLC will certainly play a role in giving them. Some more heroes, especially a hero with casualty replenishment, would be very welcome, I think, at this particular point for Cafe. But outside of that, you do have magical heroes that are pretty good. You have legendary lords as dragon dragons. You do have fire rain rockets, which are basically hellstorm rocket batteries from the Empire. I'm not exactly certain which is better, the fire rain rockets or the hellstorm. I haven't really looked into that, but either way, they are still incredibly potent. You have good ranged units, uh, crane uh, crane gunners and iron hail gunners, not necessarily the best uh, units in the game because they're too short range. They're long range, but there's they don't necessarily do the most damage. Um, Gunpowder units do have certainly some issues in, in this game, like archer units, because of their flexibility on the battlefield, end up, or crossbowmen units will end up being better in a lot of ways. But yeah, Grand Cafe is in a really good spot. They have the caravan system, which allows them to send caravans across the world. Can be risky, but you can gain an enormous amount of gold. So if I send the caravan, I would get 10,000 uh, 10, coin at most at the moment, though that can be increased even further. Though the legendary lord I've chosen, Xiao Ming, he has a benefit to caravan, so he's got more cargo capacity for them. Then you have the compass. The compass gives you either growth, control, uh, casualty replenishment. I believe you can get a uh, tech or a building that will reduce the uh, duration, so you can switch the, the, between these much easier. Uh, wherever you point the compass at, you're always going to get secondary effect like income benefit, reducing the great passion for it, getting winds of magic, etc. So you can always get some more benefits, but by default, you can get quite a bit of control or growth or casualty replenishment. I guess the casualty replenishment of the, uh, the compass is uh, there to make up for the, the fact you don't have a hero that gives you uh, casualty replenishment by default. It would be great to have a hero, but yeah, the great compass can uh, certainly do that. If there are any issues with Cafe is that they don't have the sheer power, uh, the curb stomping power of either the Warriors of Chaos or the Greenskins. Uh, their economy will require trade, will require uh, caravans, and you will also want to balance between Yin and Yang. But if you do balance between Yin and Yang, you do get an enormous amount of control, plus a control, corruption benefits, uh, summon ability in all battles, benefit to your income by basically 25%, construction cost reduction, and 20 diplomatic relations with other cafe and factions, so you can get confederacies going much, much easier. But yeah, cafe may have some holes in their roster, but they're in a really, really good spot, I'd say. Uh, they were clearly designed with a lot of love and care by Creative Assembly. 
The one thing I admit that I'm not too fond of is the yin and yang system, having to manage your structures, your lords, your heroes, and whether or not they have yin and yang, because yes, lords do have yin or yang, not necessarily legendary lords, I think, if I'm not mistaken, though, if I, I guess I could look at him. Um, but generally, lords... Uh, actually, he does have yang. Okay, um, but legendary lords, lords, and heroes do have yin or yang, and you need to balance it to be in perfect harmony to get these kind of benefits. Because if you go, if you stray down the path, you will still get some benefits if it's not too far. Uh, but if you go straight way too far, like seven plus, you lose control, a significant amount of control, uh, a significant amount of control that you can potentially. Uh, could potentially lose uh, if you are playing a uh, cafe and faction and just suffer significant penalties though at the lowest level it's just uh, minus five percent income from uh, the opposite side um, or for your buildings like for instance if I have too much in the in buildings are gonna ge generate too little income so you are forced to balance your entire uh, your entire building process it's not necessarily the most optimal. Cafe certainly has some issues when it comes to that. But yeah, as a default faction, they don't have major gaping holes in their roster. They don't have they don't have major issues with their economy. They don't have major issues um, with being able to expand across the map. They work very well. They're one of the best factions that fit out. The best faction that Creative Assembly designed for Warhammer Free. And finally, the last faction on this list, the last race on this list are the High Elves. The High Elves have consistently been one of the strongest factions in Total War Warhammer since they were introduced in Total War Warhammer 2. The reason they're so good is because they have really good control through the Promenade, uh, or rather through the Plaza chain, so they can get good control. With some changes, they are going to generate more income if they do reach 100 control in a province. The benefit of the High Elves, even if it has been nerfed in Warhammer 3, is that they have a really good scalable economy in the campaign. It's not going to be as strong early on as, say, the Greenskins are, and you may need more structures to get that kind of benefit that the Greenskins have by default in a single building, and maybe control. But the High Elves do have scalability, and scalability does matter a great deal in any campaign where you are trying to paint the map. They have good units as well. In every settlement that they can recruit, even at level 1, they can recruit spearmen and archers. Really good units, both of them. The spearmen obviously are not going to do all that much against other infantry units, but they are really good line holders, and archers are really good at dishing damage against low tier units. If there are any issues with the High Elven situation is that their baseline range units and certainly their low tier range units are just not going to have a great deal of armor piercing that's certainly a problem that the high elves do have they also don't have the best artillery in the game but they do have a strong and versatile roster by default the dlc filled that up or uh, filled that up even more uh, it, since you do have two major dlc packs you do have two legendary lords by default two for free with emmerich and alifanar and two pay DLC with Elfarian and Alariel. Now, Elfarian didn't add a lot unless you're playing him. Like, if you play him, you get the Mistwalker units. If you're not playing him, you get pretty much jack shit. Um, uh, with the exception of, what is it, Rangers and Arc Archmages. I, I mean, Archmages are important, don't get me wrong on that, but I'll get to that in a moment. And then Alariel, who added a new hero type, as well as the Sisters of Avalarn. Now, are the DLC packs important? What do you actually end up losing and how much will it affect you? So you have a good solid roster by default, be it um, regular ranged units and spearmen from your tier 1, then from your main barracks uh, chain archers with light armor and then lavern sea guards, which are a hybrid unit, a pretty good hybrid unit. These guys are not Kassar dog shit level. These guys are actually good in a lot of ways. Kassars, yeah, they won't scale very well. They won't do very well past the very early game. Uh, if you're playing as Kislev. The Lothran Seaguard will do very well in a lot of ways. They have shields. If you get them to tier 3, they have shields. They're good against large foes. They're not so terrible against armor either. So they'll do a pretty good amount. You have uh, decent cavalry. Uh, you do have dragons. <laughs> really important. You do have dragons. Dragons are incredibly strong. You do have Phoenix Guard. You do have Phoenixes. Though you're missing out the Arcane Phoenix. 
What you're losing are the Sisters of Avalon in terms of an army roster. I'd say that hurts you the most because they are that ranged unit with a lot of armor piercing that your archers just won't have. Though they're not too terrible at it, but they just aren't specialized for it. The Sisters are really that good. And Sisters of Avalon Doomstack was one of the most powerful armies in Warhammer 2. And although their, their range power has been nerfed in Warhammer 3, like it says a lot about the High Elves that they're still an incredibly powerful race in Warhammer 3, even though they've suffered what some would consider severe nerfs from Warhammer 2 and Warhammer 3. It says a lot, I gotta say. But with no DLC, you are losing uh, the Sisters. I'd say that's probably the most important, and you are losing Archmages. The Archmage, Archmage Lords um, can be useful because you, you, although you have regular mages as uh, as heroes available by default with no DLC, the Archmages just allow you to have pretty much every one of your army led by a mage. So if you want the magical ability, you can have it through them, as opposed to relying on heroes, where heroes can be limited unless you get a very large and vast empire. So having archmages, not having archmages can be limiting. Although, to be fair, the princes and princes that you get by default are still pretty good and uh, still pr in a pretty good uh, spot. But yeah, not har having archmages uh, does, uh, does certainly limit things. What about heroes? Will you feel the lack of uh, DLC heroes? Not really. I, I would argue that not really at all, because you do have the nobles and you do have the mages av available and the lore masters of Hoa, though you need the building for it. Um, the nobles in particular are great because they're good combatants. So are the lore masters, though. The lore masters are mm, not necessarily the best. They're more like a support hero, whereas the nobles are a full -on combat, uh, have full-on combat potential and have a lot more maneuverability on the battlefield than the Lord Masters do have. Uh, but the Nobles have a lot more maneuverability, and they're just going to do better, I feel, than uh, than the Lord Masters uh, overall. Like, if you can get a lot of Nobles in your army, that would certainly benefit uh, you. Though having Lord Masters is not bad, they're just not uh, going to be as good. Like, uh, like uh, if you look, uh, just to click on Cavill over here, like, they have control and training. Training can be useful, but not necessarily too important. I'd say having the replenishment of nobles is is more significant. Though you can combine the two, get training and replenishment, certainly get that uh, going. But yeah, the High Elves are in a pretty good spot, especially early on. They do have scalability with their economy, with their empire in the mid to late game. They're just losing some mid to late game options, specifically losing the Sisters, losing some Phoenixes. If you're... Uh, and if you wanted to play Elfar uh, Elfarian, uh, obviously not, uh, the Mistwalker units, what that Elfarian has are some of the best High Elven units in the entire game. But really, but that those are only available to him, so you need to have the DLC pack regardless to be able to uh, uh, to use that. So yeah, um, Elves are in a pretty good spot. By default, the DLC just fleshes them out uh, a bit more gives them some really good ranged options with the sisters but outside of losing that and losing dark mages they are not going to suffer uh, an enormous amount though it has to be said that of all the factions on this list i would say they suffered the most but all of the factions that i've had on this list list are incredibly strong are incredibly strong even with no DLC, all of them without exception. The DLC just adds some stuff uh, that helps them out, like replenishment for the greenskins through the river troll uh, hag. Trolls can be useful in some situations, they're not going to miss them that much. Uh, having a type of uh, lord for the greenskins, having specialized units if you're talking about the warriors of chaos, uh, those can be good, but you don't need them. Could you use the sisters? Sure. But if you rely on our range stack, uh, uh, doom stack, so to speak, of archers, some eagle claw, bull for horse for artillery, and some spearmen to be line holders, you are going to have some fairly competent armies if you are playing the high elves. Not the best, but playing in immortal empires, and this is the key, playing in immortal empires is really about getting very large armies across the entire world that's one of the things that really really matters and that's what separates good races good factions good lords from those that are weak and yes there are races for which dlc not having dlc really really screws them over in a lot of ways be it the empire for not having archers the skaven for not having the weapon weapons teams and so on but i'll cover that in a future video for now christine signing out don't forget to subscribe like enable notifications and i'll see you next time